Welcome everybody to the University of Applied Research and Development, our educators podcast here with Principal Norman Vajela, who is in charge of an alternative education school with over 650 students. Welcome, Norma. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much for this invitation to be here tonight. Hey, look, I'm really excited to learn more about the school that you lead and your particular role. So why don't you share with us about that? Okay, so uh, my school is an alternative education model, and it serves students that are typically have either dropped out of high school or are in the process of disengaging for various factors. Um, so we serve students in a non-classroom based model. It's, a, it's independent studies. So we do a lot of online instruction. We do a lot of small group instruction. We do a lot of like small, small cohorts so that we can meet the needs of our students. Um, but it, it, is, it allows us in being an independent studies model, it, it allows us to do a lot of innovative programs to meet the needs of students and to do a lot of work to prevent them from really dropping out of school. So the goal is to get them to graduation and not only graduate, but also expose them to what's beyond graduation. Wow. So you would have to have a range of other types of teachers and support staff that may not be in a more traditional school environment. Could you tell us more about that? Correct. So we work with a team of educators that are constantly looking at, you know, the, the, the human side of students and um, their adverse factors and also their motivation. I think a lot of it, you know, in education right now, we're, we're dealing with a lot of inspiring students and motivating them um, to accomplish their goals. So we work with a lot of educators that just, you know, have the capacity and, and the, the, the passion for bringing innovation into education. So we look at, our, at the traditional model as a model that fits a lot of students, but we also look at that traditional model as a model that may not serve the needs of every student. So at our school, what we're attempting to do is just constantly innovating so that we can meet the needs of those students and just like have positive outcomes. We do a lot of exploring data. We do a lot of uh, exploring, you know, behaviors of students. We do a lot of dealing with emotions of students because a lot of them are coming with like, a, a lot of emotional charges that affect them in the classroom. And therefore that's also why they have previously disengaged. So we have this, uh, cohort of people of educators that are constantly asking questions about like what is the data telling us and how do we formulate a plan that meets the needs of the students and I think that's what I love about alternative education is that it, it allows us to be innovative and in looking at resilience in a totally different way that it's not only academic but sometimes resilience is you know we change the behavior of our students or we uh, we engage more students in whatever program we've been able to have students that are passionate about math and english and you know that's success every single day is like measuring our success by like little nuggets little little things that we're accomplishing um, mm. But it's very different. It's very collaborative. I think as the my role as the principal at the school is kind of like to orchestrate a whole bunch of people with a lot of ideas, but kind of like bring them together to the table and say, okay, let's formulate a plan and let's put that in place and let's see how are we going to measure what we want to mm -hmm. accomplish. Because if we allow everybody to just bring ideas and innovate, then we don't measure anything. It's just going to be ideas and we're just going to spend a lot of time talking about it. And I think in the years that I've been in education, I found that it's like, we have to talk about it, but we also right. have to have very clear goals and measure those goals and say, mm -hmm. when are we gonna measure and who's gonna be responsible? So I think my role, you know, I always see my role as the administrator is like, I have to orchestrate all of these things that are happening in the school and be able to like get results and be able to measure and share those results with my team, with the teachers, with the parents, with the stakeholders, with anybody that wants to hear like, what is it that we're doing at our school? You've said data a couple of times. What are some of those data points, the things that you measure and it informs your decision-making? We measure, um, so we measure courses, we measure uh, attendance, we measure, uh, we, right now we're in the process of breaking all of our students by race uh, and gender. 
because there's a huge opportunity and equity gap. So now we're looking at data points by who are our students, how are our black and brown students performing opposed to like, you know, in comparison to our other students, our white and Asian students. Um, so we do a lot of data points on um, academics, of course. We do a lot of uh, data points on grades. We do a lot of data points on graduation rates. We do a lot of data points on participations of students. So we do a lot of analysis of like, who is it that we're engaging so that we could say, okay, are we doing well or do we need to continue to do enough more to, it's not enough for a group of students. You mentioned previously about um, adverse circumstances. Is that related to the adverse childhood experiences study, ACES study? Yeah. We're doing a lot some of, of those uh, things? training. Yeah, we're doing a lot of trauma informed because our school, uh, our school serves a student population that is uh, heavily, I would say, heavily affected by adverse uh, circumstances. So we do a lot of um, training for the teachers on understanding, you know, uh, how these adverse factors are affecting our students in the classroom, how they, how it affects them academically, emotionally, and also how, how they behave, and also their motivation. So we do a lot of training on, on that, but also we do a lot of resiliency programs so that we can address the needs of our students. Because we do understand that, you know, a lot of our students are dealing with a lot of things that have nothing to do with academics. And that's why they disengaged at times. But if we can do more of the work of mentorship or, you know, grouping students and with pairing students with positive mentors or positive people that can support their resilience, then we're doing a bit more of the work. Um, we do a lot of also of, um, supporting our students when there's behavior because we do deal with students that have typically not done well in school um, so we have a lot of behavior issues you know but even when dealing with behavior we see it through a trauma-informed lens where instead of treating that student and disciplining that student in a negative way we say okay this student you know let's say they got in a fight which it used to happen a lot when i first started at this school five years ago we used to have fights all the time and then we said, okay, let's do the work of restorative justice, of trauma-informed, and let's do the work of mentorship for these students. So it used to be that students get in trouble and we used to look at how do we um, remove this student from the classroom or how do we remove this student from the school? Now we shift it to how do we support this student to make better choices, to have a, you know, better behavior, to have better motivation, to feel better about being in school. So now, you know, like I, I people always say like, you know, when, when there's a student that gets in trouble, they know they're gonna get hugs because it's not gonna be like you did something wrong, but rather like we see it from a lens, like you're struggling with something, something happened, you don't know how to cope with this, but we're gonna support you. So instead Wonderful. of kicking the student out, we're saying we're going to connect you with a school psychologist, with a school counselor. Somebody's going to become your mentor and check in on you. We're going to do a home visit and check in on the family. And it's like, you know, shifting it from more of a human um, way of approaching education. But that also goes into a lot of um, supporting our educators that are dealing mm -hmm. with all of these situations, you know, because when we're dealing with students, and I think it's all across the world that we're seeing students that are coming in with various traumas, but also dealing with the educators and saying, we have to care for our educators so that they can be the best in front of our students. So trauma also means, you know, trauma informed also means providing training and opportunities and outlets for our staff to work on their own wellness. Um, and we work together, you know, every day is like, we're in triage every day, but also every day where right. we give each other permission to say like, today was a tough day and maybe somebody needs to cover for you or support you, or maybe you need to go home because it's been heavy, you know, and I'll give you an mm -hmm. example at the beginning of this year, um, at the beginning of last year, we had within a month, we had three deaths for 650 students. We had three deaths back to back. One of our students was shot um, outside of his, his home. 
was shot like 12 times. Another one of our students was shot at, you know, at work. Uh, and another one of our students committed suicide. So with all of that, it's like heavy trauma that our students are dealing with. Our school communities dealing with it. Our educators are dealing with it. But we've been able to do a lot of the work of like, how do we heal together so that we can continue to do this work? You know, because there were days that it was tough even for me to show up to work and say, I have to be the orchestrator here when I'm struggling. You know, my kids are, my kids are struggling. So anyway, I think it's just like humanizing, humanizing education has been a big theme for our school because our kids are struggling. And when our kids are struggling, our educators, our administrators struggle too. So what do you do personally as the leader? where the buck stops with you. What do you do to decompress after a day that's been really tough? Um, I do, I, I practice what I tell my educators that they should do. You know, um, I spend a lot of time with my family. Um, I talk it out. Um, I also do the, you know, the, the alone time for reflection. Um, I do a lot of reading and just continuing to learn and doing things that continue to inspire me. Um, and I also reach out to other educators. I think I, I reach out to my other principal friends because I think when you get in a, in a position of leadership of a school, it could feel lonely. Um, but you, you have to have people that you can reach out and say, you know what, today was a tough day. And, you know, let's talk about it. So I, I think for me, it's a lot of like that reflection and, and talking about it and also being able to say like, I'm coming home and I'm spending time with my kids. You know, I'm coming home and I'm spending time in the garden and doing like forgetting about all the troubles of school so that I could be fresh and ready for tomorrow. You know, and tomorrow we're going to tackle, tackle this again, but I have to be well, like well and whole. And also I, I do give myself permission that there are days that I'm just like, I, I need to leave work two hours early or I can't make it into work. And I do have a supportive uh, admin team, you know, so my other administrators that can also say like, are you okay today? You know, and I think we give ourselves permission to say, to ask those questions like, are you okay? And to be able to say like, maybe today I'm not okay. You know, so maybe today I need you to cover for me. So it's, it's a lot of like partnership. And I think if, if education can become that partnership, we, we can do the work. It's hard work, you know. Mm. Um, but I think it's a lot of collaboration and just being able to have a support system also as an administrator. So you did your doctoral studies at Pepperdine? Yes. Yeah. Was your thesis, your focus around alternative education? My focus was around, no, it was around students that have dropped out of high school. Okay. Um, and the reason was because I myself was a high school dropout. I dropped out of school when I was 16 and I returned back to school when I was 19. But when I came back to school, and I think this is, you know, a problem that it's not only in the United States, that it's like, if you miss that opportunity of graduating high school, the question is like, what else is there for a kid that drops out? And for me back in, you know, in, in the 90s, when I was looking for, you know, what do I do now if I dropped out of high school, but I still want to continue my education, I was heavily labeled as, you know, you're a high school dropout, like there's not many options. And, you know, I said, okay, what are, what, are my, what are my pathways? What other pathways can I uh, accomplish? And I ended up taking the route of a GED and then an AA degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and then constantly asking the question of why are we giving up on kids that don't graduate high school? So that was like my, my mission for getting a doctorate degree was to prove that a kid that dropped out of high school is able to come back and accomplish amazing things um, so don't label us as dropouts, you know? So what I did with my dissertation work was ask people that also dropped out of school, why is it that they made it? And in finding mm. that, being able to replicate kind of why they were successful so that we can implement it into programs 
so that we can prevent kids from dropping out. And if they dropped out, that is like, how do we engage them? So it's basically, mm -hmm. how do we not give up on kids? That's the nutshell of my dissertation. It was like, a, <laughs> like, I have to prove that we can do this. And, you know, mm -hmm. and I proved it. But now the work that I do, everything that I do is around like program implementation, development around how do we build students so that they don't give up and how do we bring students that have given up and give them resources and, mm. you know, and, and everything that they need so that they don't give up so that they know that they also deserve that they have the right of an education. Norma, I, th I think it's quite inspirational that you come from that background and made the decision that you were going to continue forward regardless of that gap. I just think that's fantastic because you can speak with your Thank students you. and your staff with authenticity. So that's, that's inspirational. Norma, I'd love from your perspective just to speak to, just as we wrap up, just speak to the aspiring leaders who are watching this and those aspiring leaders that are classroom teachers or even vice principals who are looking to go to that next level. What are some experiences or learnings that you would encourage them to pursue? Um, I would encourage that you have passion and purpose, that you analyze your passion and purpose constantly. Um, because the work is difficult, um, but also the work is beautiful. The work of leading a school, the work of working with other educators, is it's an, a beautiful, it's the most beautiful thing that I think we can provide to our communities. Um, have a lot of people around you that are way smarter than you and have other talents that you may not have so that you could work together to make educational programs better. Um, I would also say like constantly learn, constantly continue to learn, constantly continue to reach out to, to learn more um, and inspire other uh, people to do the same. And I think one of the, the, the biggest recommendations that I have is to always put yourself first so that you can be the better person for everybody that you're guiding. Um, and for me, you know, when times get tough, I always ask myself, if it's not me doing the work, then who will do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I also tell my teachers, like, if it's not you supporting that student, who's gonna do it? You know, mm -hmm. so it's constantly asking, like, we have a purpose and we have to be the best for them. But if it's not you and if we all give up as, a, you know, collaboratively give up on improving education, then who's going to do it? So I would say it's just continue to question, like, if it's not me being the best, then who? Wonderful. Dr. Norma, I really want to thank you for your time, for sharing your experiences and your wisdom and also your inspirational story. Thank you for being with us on the podcast today. Thank you very much. Thank you.